For this part of the course, we're going to take a look at audit planning. Now, the good news is that audit planning involves techniques which you've seen on the F8 paper or paper 2.6, the lower level audit paper, and there's not really any new knowledge that you need at this level. The only problem or challenge, I suppose, is that the questions are going to be rather harder because when you're looking for things like audit risk, the issues that arise are going to be higher level accounting issues rather than lower level, but the techniques are the same. So what we're going to do is take a fairly quick look at a reminder of what audit risk and audit planning is all about. Once we've gone through that, which as I said will be fairly quick, we're then going to really learn by having a look at a past exam question. Now I've already mentioned audit risk as one big issue, but just before we look at that, a little reminder of something else, as this often comes up in questions as well. And that is materiality. Now, you may well remember from F8 that materiality is all about trying to assess what sort of mistakes in the accounts would be important enough that people would care about them. And mistakes are generally material for one of two reasons, either by their size, because they're numerical mistakes, or by their nature. When we are planning an audit, our main concern is assessing mistakes by size. Assessing things by nature we can't really do until we've actually found them, which will be towards the end of the audit. But at this early stage, we're trying to give the audit team some idea of how big a mistake would need to be before they should care about it. So how do we go about assessing materiality? Well, typically, as I'm sure you remember, there are three main measures we tend to use. We try to base it on revenue or sales, turnover. We base it on profit before tax and we base it on total assets so that we can factor in the size of the balance sheet or statement of financial position as well. Let's just consider some numbers and then consider some of the maybe higher issues that come out of this. So let's imagine that those are the figures we've got for our client. How do we assess materiality using those? Well, typically we look at somewhere between half to 1% of revenue, somewhere between 5 to 10% of profit before tax, and around about 1 to 2% of total assets. So let's do those calculations and see what we end up with. So, based on our calculations, materiality would seem to be around about the half a million to maybe one and a half million mark. But that's quite a big range. So, which of these numbers are we going to use? Are we going to use all of them? Some of them? Because really what the audit team want to hear at this early stage of the process is just a rough guide 
of what they should be looking for. Well, one way to deal with this is to look at these three ranges and see if they overlap in one particular area, because that way we could take the overlap and use that, because by doing that we're using all three pieces of information. Well, as you can see, this example has been set up to guarantee there is an overlap, and those three ranges overlap from 0.7 million to 1.0 million. Therefore, if I were planning this audit, I think I'd be tempted to say that materiality at the planning stage, at least, is somewhere in that range. What we're basically saying is that anything less than 0.7 million, probably not material. We'd keep a note of it during the audit, because lots of small mistakes can mount up to one big one, of course. Anything more than a million, definitely material. Anything in the gap, 0.7 to a million, borderline, we'd have to use our judgment. Now, that's all fairly straightforward. Just one or two other issues to consider. Uh, firstly, if this were a new client, I think for safety I'd be tempted to look a little bit harder for errors in the accounts, and therefore I'd probably set materiality towards the lower end of that 0.7 to 1 million range. I might even just pick 0.7 million. So that's one issue, new clients. Another issue is this. Bear in mind that the figures we've just used to assess materiality at the planning stage, we're probably doing this before the year's actually over. So all of those figures are estimates. It might therefore be worthwhile using last year's real figures because at least we know that that year has finished and been audited and the numbers could be trusted more. And one other final thought to consider. In this rather neat example, I've deliberately made sure that the three ranges all overlap. But what if we had the same basic information, but maybe this company's profit was fairly low? Maybe it's even a loss. Maybe they're barely breaking even. If the profit figure is tiny, the materiality, on profit at least, would come out almost at zero, meaning we'd have to check virtually everything, however small. If one of the numbers gives an odd result, it would be fairly typical to ignore it on the basis that it is out of sync, if you like, with the other two. But there you go. There's a few basics on materiality. What we need to move on to now is the far more important audit risk. So, the audit risk model is something that we met on paper F8, or for some of you maybe 2.6, the lower level audit paper. The model is exactly the same here. I'm going to take you back through it shortly, and hopefully it will ring a few bells, and then we can go straight into a question and see how it actually gets tested. But first, the model. Audit risk, quite simply, is the risk that the audit goes wrong. In other words, we carry out the audit process, but give the wrong audit opinion. As some people have suggested, the real risk is not giving the wrong opinion, it's that somebody finds out we've given the wrong opinion. But as professionals, of course, we want to get it right, even if no one finds out that we got it wrong. So, the risk of the wrong opinion... Now, if you remember your audit reports from paper F8, you probably remember there are quite a few different opinions we could give. But surely the most damaging opinion would be for us to say that the accounts are true and fair when in fact they're not. So let's consider that as the most likely audit risk.
So, audit risk, the risk that the financial statements are materially wrong and the auditor's substantive tests fail to detect this. Well, the risk that the financial statements are materially wrong has got a name and, not surprisingly, it's called financial statement risk. The risk that the auditor's substantive tests fail to detect mistakes in the accounts also has a name. And also, not very surprisingly, it's called detection risk. So audit risk is a combination of financial statement risk and detection risk. Sometimes an exam question might ask you for financial statement risks. And as you can see, it's part of audit risk. So if you just pretend it is audit risk and ignore detection risks, you've got the right answer. So no great problem there. But some of you will be looking at this and saying, hang on a minute, I thought when I did audit risk before, there were three elements to it. And there are, because financial statement risk can be broken down into two chunks. Why might a set of accounts be wrong? Well, there are two main contributory factors. The first one is the risk of making mistakes just due to the nature of the company and what the company is doing. So, for example, a complicated company with complicated transactions is more likely to get it wrong. And that is known as inherent risk. Now, one good example of uh, an area of industry where transactions can be complicated would be a bank. But if you went to a bank and said, I'm going to have to check your accounts more because you're more likely to have got it wrong, no doubt the bank would say, hang on a minute, we know it's complicated, and that's why we've got very, very complicated systems, highly trained staff, to try to make sure that we've dealt with that problem. So in other words, we can't just look at the inherent risk, we've also got to look at how good the company is at dealing with those inherent risks. How good are its systems? And that is all about looking at control risk. So there we go. Audit risk is a combination of financial statement risk and detection risk. Financial statement risk can then be broken up into two. Why might a set of accounts be wrong? Nature of the business combined with how good its controls are. Now that we've taken a look at the audit risk model again, we know that if a question says identify audit risks, we're going to need to look for inherent control and detection. Of those three, by far the most important, at this level at least, is inherent risk. Because that's where we can show our understanding of the company, its transactions, and how that then leads to the danger of the accounts being wrong. And that's a key skill for auditors. So what we need to do is consider how we might approach an exam question on audit risk. And once we've done that, 
we need to apply that technique to an actual question. So let's consider technique. If I was in your position, sitting this exam, and I had an audit risk question, this is how I would go about planning my answer. The first thing I'd do is plan my answer in note form very quickly. And to do that for an audit risk question, I'd do this down the left-hand side of the page. So the first thing I do is inherent control and detection. But because I know that inherent risk will be the biggest part of the answer, I'm going to break that up a bit. Three main things to look out for. Are there any clues that this company might have going concern problems? Now please remember we are planning the audit. We're right at the very start. We're not going to say this company is going out of business because at this stage we simply don't know. We're just looking for clues that would suggest we need to investigate further. Manipulation risk is the risk that the directors might deliberately make the accounts wrong. Now, of course, some people believe that directors will always try to make the accounts look wrong, making them look better than they actually are, because it makes them, the directors, look better. But in an exam question, we need specific reasons why they might want to cheat. Good examples would be things like listed companies, uh, companies who are potentially about to be taken over and want to make things look very good. Companies who are about to go to the bank and try to borrow money also want to make themselves look good. The third one is the big one. Key balances. This is where we look at the question and try to identify which numbers in the accounts are most likely to be at risk of error. So that's the framework I'm going to use, and now that we've looked at that, it's time to pick an exam question and see if this works. Okay, so here we go then with a question. Uh, the question we're going to use is from the June 2004 paper and is called Harrier Motors. So here we go with Harrier Motors. First of all, let's take a look at the requirements and see what the question's actually asking us to do. Uh, it is not just about audit risk, this one, although that's the main reason we're going to look at it. Uh, we'll have a brief look at the other bits as well. We may as well use it for extra practice. So, the first thing we need to do is, using the information provided, identify and explain the audit risks... to be addressed when planning the final audit of Harrier Motors for the year ending 30th of June 2004. So, no problem there. Uh, bear in mind that this question came up in June 2004. This is a real-time exam, so what you were meant to be thinking was, here I am sitting in June 2004 in about three to four weeks' time, this company's year end is going to happen, so we're three to four weeks before the end of their year, and I'm planning the audit work that's going to happen after the year end. So that's the sort of time frame involved. This one's worth 12 marks, and my initial suspicion is that 12 marks probably is going to mean I need to find 12 risks. However, in quite a few marking guides, especially when it says identify and explain, there might be up to a mark and a half per risk, if you explain it well. So I'd still look for about 12, so if my explanations aren't brilliant, I can still pile up some marks, but you might only need to find eight. Part B. Identify and briefly explain the principal matters to be addressed in Harrier Motors' instructions for the conduct of its physical inventory count as at the 30th of June. So Harrier Motors are going to do a stock take. Now, a couple of things from that. Number one, 
If they're going to do a stock take, then stock inventory is clearly very important to them, and it probably suggests that it's not necessarily that simple. Otherwise, why would we have this question about stock take instructions? And if the inventory is not that simple, surely it's an audit risk, because they might get it wrong. So already in part A of the question, I'm thinking one of my risks at least, possibly more than one risk, is going to be about inventory. The second issue is, what is part B actually asking? Harrier, our client, is going to count its stock. To make sure it does it properly, it's going to develop some instructions which presumably will be handed out or read out to all of the people doing their stock take. So what we need to do is think, what could go wrong with this company's stock take and then develop instructions to try to deal with those potential problems? Six marks probably means I'm looking to talk about six problems. Part C. Describe the audit work, typically audit testing, to be carried out in respect of the useful life of the Unifit brand name as at the year end. Now, that's quite a difficult question. It's seven marks, which probably means seven pieces of audit work, all about just one thing, the useful life of a brand. How long will that brand have value to the company? And that is a rather difficult question. Anyway, we'll worry about parts B and C in a little while. Firstly, let's deal with part A. We're looking for audit risks. So, as I said to you before, technique. Down the side of the page, I'm going to write inherent control and detection risk. But this time, I'm going to leave a lot of space on inherent because that's where most of my planning is going to happen. So, going concern, manipulation, key balances. I'm planning my answer in the exam. I won't be handing this in to be marked. I'm going to cross through this before I write my actual answer out. So there's no need for it to be desperately neat. You don't have to write whole words out. Just enough so that when you're writing your actual answer from this, you know what it means. No need to leave too much space for control risk and detection risk. Uh, from my experience of questions, you don't get a huge amount coming up on that. So, that's the plan. Now we need to go and read the story and jot a few things down into this. OK, let's read it through. Harrier Motors deals in motor vehicles, spare parts, after-sales servicing, and undertakes car body repairs. They sell cars. Well, clearly inventory is going to be an important issue. Cars individually are quite valuable, so inventory is going to be fairly material. They have spare parts as well, so that will be more inventory. They provide after-sales servicing. Now, that suggests to me that when they sell these cars, there's some sort of guarantee or warranty attached to promise to put things right if they go wrong. And that is going to create a provision. Now, at the moment, I'm not 100% sure that that's what it is. They might, for example, simply sell cars and then say to people, if they go wrong, bring them back and for a price, we'll fix them. In which case, there's no need for an obligation. They're not promising anything. You've still got to pay for it. So I'll wait until I've read through the story, but at the moment, I'm assuming a warranty provision. And warranty provisions are an audit risk because provisions are estimates. And estimates are difficult to get right. It also says they undertake car body repairs. Now, I'm just thinking, if they're doing servicing and repair work, what if at the year end they're halfway through some repair work? Any cars that are sitting there at the year end being repaired well, they've done the work, or some of it, but they've not yet invoiced the customer because they haven't finished. And therefore, that would count as work in progress. 
because they've started doing some work and therefore they're earning money, but because they haven't finished it, they haven't billed for it. So we might have a little cut-off issue, another audit risk, with that. Not a major issue, so don't worry if you didn't see that, but just worth considering. During the financial year, the company expanded its operations from five to eight sites. Well, that's a lovely thing to see. Because that expansion from five to eight sites is a 60% expansion, which is pretty rapid and gives rise to audit risks. The first thing I'd say is rapid growth causes a potential problem called overtrading, in that you're trying to grow so quickly, you run out of the cash you need to grow. So, potential cash flow problems which could give rise to going concern issues. The other place I can put this in my answer is probably control risk, because managing eight sites in a company is rather harder than managing five. So it increases the risk that things are going wrong without management knowing about it. In fact, while I have this on the screen, more locations makes it more of a risk that the auditors don't spot mistakes because there are more locations where the mistakes could be happening. Easier to miss them. So in fact, that single sentence might give rise to three separate risks with three lots of marks. Now, I can't help feeling that would be a little bit too generous, but you don't know. So I'd go for all three. Each site has a car showroom, service workshop, and part storage. Now, why are we being told this? Is this just general introduction stuff to set the tone of the question? Well, maybe. But there are two words in that sentence that worry me. Car showroom. Because when I see the words car showroom, it makes me think of one particular area of accountancy that's rather difficult and therefore an audit risk. Typically with car showrooms, the showrooms don't actually buy the cars and then sell them to us. That would be an enormous upfront cash flow problem. Instead, they tend to borrow the cars and pay a fee to borrow them from the manufacturer and they only actually buy them at the point they sell them to us. That is known as consignment stock and it causes big accounting issues. When do you account for it? Do you say the showrooms have bought the cars when the cars arrive? Or have they bought them only when the cars then are sold to customers? Technically they probably only buy them at the point they sell them. But in substance if they've got full control of those cars from the point that they arrive, we probably have to call them their cars, even though legally they don't own them yet. So that's an example of substance of the transaction overriding the strict legal form of it. So that's going to be an audit risk. And when they actually buy the cars is going to affect purchases, liabilities and inventory. So there we go, some audit risks. Back to the question. In May 2004, management appointed an experienced chartered certified accountant to set up an internal audit department. Well, an internal audit department is part of the whole risk management and control process in a company, so surely that will reduce control risk. Control should now work better. The only problem, of course, is they were only appointed in May, and that's last month, because it's currently June 2004, isn't it? So they're only there for the final month of the year, so this will be good for controls next year, 
but this year will have minimal effect. And that leaves us with an exam technique question. If it's not really going to have much effect, do we just not mention it at all? Or do we say, this will reduce control risk, and then say, but not much? Well, surely it's better to mention it and then show you understand that it's not so good rather than say nothing, because you can't be given marks for nothing, can you? So I'm putting it in. Now please note, I am writing on the screen a lot more than I would actually write if I was sitting in the exam. And that, of course, is because I'm not sitting in an exam. I'm doing this so that you can understand what I'm talking about. So if this is the exam, you need to write less than this because you haven't got time to explain it in full. You'll be doing that when you write your actual answer out. This is only a plan. OK, so on we go with the question. New cars are imported. Well, if they're imported, that's coming in from a foreign country, which must give a risk that there's foreign exchange going on. And that complicates matters, so it's a risk. And again, purchases, liabilities and inventory could all be wrong if they've used the wrong currencies. New cars are imported on consignment. Well, we've already spotted this because we saw car showrooms. Now we're going to be told a little bit more about it. They come in every three months from one supplier. Now, you might be tempted to say only using one supplier is dangerous. What if that supplier goes bust? But the problem is, if you walk past a car showroom, typically all the cars in there are from one manufacturer. So it's probably the nature of the industry. So you might be tempted to put in, maybe next to going concern, that the reliance on a single supplier is a bit risky. But I'm not going to, because I think it's the nature of the industry. Harrier pays the purchase price of the cars plus 3% three, three months after taking delivery. So in come the cars, and three months later, they buy them. Harrier does not return unsold cars, although it has a legal right to do so. Well, if it was returning cars that it couldn't sell, I'd be tempted to say that Harrier hasn't in substance bought the cars when they arrive. Because if you can send them back again, well, they're not really yours, are they? But the thing is, whilst they have the right to send them back, they don't. So what's actually happening here? Cars come in, and three months later, Harrier pays for them. In substance, they seem to be buying cars on three months' credit. As such... As with any other transaction like that, the moment the goods arrive is when I would say a purchase has happened. So what is the risk? The risk is that Harrier are only recording the purchase of the cars and the associated liability and the fact that they've got stock on the day they pay for them. That's the danger. Therefore, the risk is that purchases, liabilities and inventory are all understated because the most recent delivery hasn't been recorded yet. Now, I notice that I'm about to write down a point I've already done. So, I can deal with this fairly easily. All I need to do is now add the word understated to that explanation. And that's the audit risk I'll be putting in the answer. But there is another issue as well. What do we do with that 3%? What does it represent? Is it part of the price of the cars? It's not, is it? They're paying 3% for the benefit 
of getting the cars and only paying for them three months later. That is a finance cost. So we also ought to make the point that inventory could be overstated if they've not treated that as a finance cost. OK, back we go to the question. Harrier offers trade-ins on all sales of new and used cars. Now, I seem to remember that when we did trade-ins and part exchanges and stuff like that, when we do bookkeeping, they're a little bit fiddly. In fact, there is a bit of a risk here. Harrier might offer way too much money for someone's old car, not because it's really worth that, but to convince them to spend a lot more money on a new car. The danger is they buy some heap of old rusting metal for what looks like $1,000, but that $1,000 is not really buying that car, it's actually a discount on the new one. In reality, they've bought that pile of rusting metal for about a dollar. So there is a danger with trade-ins that the cars they are buying as part exchanges are overvalued. We go to the question again. New car sales carry a three-year manufacturer's warranty and used cars carry a six-month guarantee. Well, as we suspected, warranties, guarantees, and that creates a legal obligation to repair those cars in the future. So that will require a provision at Harrier's year-end and provisions are always an audit risk because they're estimates. I also noticed there that it said manufacturer's warranty, and yet Harrier aren't the ones making the cars. They're importing them from overseas. Which would seem to suggest that if any of these cars go wrong, Harrier repairs them and then reclaims the money from the manufacturer, and that's a contingent asset. So there's a danger that they've not disclosed that contingent asset. Now this is looking good. The number of risks in front of me is building up pretty quickly and we've still got quite a lot left to read. Once we get to the end of this process we need to remember that this is just an answer plan, a very good way of practicing questions, but when we sit the real exam we've got to write this out in full. So I'm going to pick one of the risks and just show you what I'd actually write in the exam, in full. Many used cars are sold for cash. Cash creates a risk. Because if you're selling them for cash and potentially buying trading cars for cash as well, there is a danger that not all of the transactions of the company are being recorded. Because if you buy and sell things for cash, you can do that without much paperwork being created. Back to the question again. An extensive range of spare parts is held for which perpetual inventory records are kept. What does that mean? Well, perpetual inventory records simply means that when inventory arrives, the records are updated, and when inventory goes, the records are updated. So in theory, at any point in time, the inventory records tell you what you've got. So it should be pretty accurate. Storekeepers carry out continuous checking. So not only have they got records that should be pretty accurate, 
someone's checking them as well. And that tends to suggest that the control risk over spare parts is fairly low, suggesting that that part of inventory could be pretty accurate. My only concern is that the people doing the counting are the storekeepers, who surely are the very people who could be stealing the stuff in the first place. So, in my answer, a bit of a control risk point here that I think we should make. Okay, back we go to the question again. Mr. Dupe, the sales executive, selects a car from each consignment, and remember that's every three months, to use for all his business and personal travelling until the next consignment is received. Such cars are sold at a discount as X demonstration models. Well, possibly a couple of issues in there. If he's using a brand new car every three months, that's a taxable benefit. So there's a danger that the company is under-accounting for the tax on that. And then on top of that, if they're selling those cars at a discount, because there are obviously miles on the clock, he's been driving them, might it be that there are some cars in stock that cost that amount, but are being sold for slightly less at a bit of a loss because there are miles on the clock? Now, there's only one Mr. Dupe, and he can only drive one car at a time, so it's probably immaterial, but still might be worth mentioning in the answer. Now, the truth is, we've easily got enough not just to pass the question, but probably score 100% on part A. But we'll keep going so that we've seen all the risks that are in there. Car servicing and body repairs are carried out in workshops by employed and subcontracted service engineers. Well, I can't think of any obvious exciting audit risks from that. I suppose if someone's contracted rather than salaried, there might be some liabilities because they're probably invoicing every now and again and being paid. But I can't really get too excited about that. Um, most jobs are started and finished in a day and invoiced immediately on completion. Now, that suggests that the work in progress point I made right at the beginning of the question is irrelevant. There are no cars at the year end where they've done part of the work and haven't invoiced yet. In May 2003, now remember it's June 2004 in this question, so that's a year ago, Harrier purchased a brand name, Unifit, which is now applied to the parts it supplies. Brand names are an intangible asset, and the main risk with those is always going to be impairment. The fact that you paid for it, but who knows if it still has a value. Management has not amortised this intangible asset as it believes its useful life to be indefinite. Can they do that? Well, yes, they can. With intangibles, you amortise over their useful lives, typically a maximum of 20 years, but you can go over 20 or not amortise at all, just as Harrier are, as long as they're doing an annual impairment review. So the risk here is that they've bought the brand for that, they've not amortised it at all, so it's still sitting in the accounts at that value. The danger is some of its value has now been lost. And there we go. We've got to the end of the story, picked out as many risks as we can find, 
Let's just have a quick look and make sure we've got enough. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and there's some more down here, of course. Well, even if it's one mark per point, we've easily got more than twelve. So there's plenty here. The next job is for me to show you how I'd actually write one of these out so you can see the level of detail needed. Now, we need to select one item that I'm going to write out in full. And since, in technical terms, one of the harder points of the question is the consignment stock, let me show you what I'd write for that. So, in my answer, I'd have a big section headed up inherent risks. And then I'd have a subheading within that for consignment stock. Now, when you're explaining audit risks, the key is to make it clear why it is an audit risk. The danger is we simply copy stuff out of the question without ever explaining why it counts as an audit risk. And, of course, auditors' main issue is that the accounts are true and fair. So try to talk in terms of why the mistakes might be there, why the financial statements might be wrong. So, as I explained as I was going through the question, the risk here is that that last consignment from overseas hasn't been recorded by Harrier and they're waiting to record it when they actually pay for the cars. And since they never seem to return any cars, those cars are theirs the moment they arrived. So the risk is understatement. Now, clearly that's quite a detailed explanation. And that's because it's quite a complicated point. Some of the other things in the answer potentially could be explained rather more quickly than that. But notice the style. Fairly concise, talking about why the accounts might be wrong and where they might be wrong. And I've tried to limit myself to about five to six lines of explanation so I can move on and get on to the next point. Always write in sentences. Try to write in paragraphs, but fairly short ones. And that's what I'd write in the exam.